I will now call to order now that we have a quorum. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, welcome everyone back after this spring break. And um, we're going to go ahead and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance before we do ro roll call. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America. to the Republic for which to the it stands. Republic. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. And um, Ms. Reese, if you can uh, lead us in roll call, please. Thank you, Commissioner. Chairperson Olivia Diaz. Present. Vice Chairperson William McCurdy. Present. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig. Commissioner Sharon Davis, Commissioner Michael Disman, Here. Commissioner Tick Siegelblum, Commissioner Dan Shaw, Commissioner Lushana Turner. A quorum is present and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reeson. May the record reflect that Ms. Commissioner Siegelblum is out due to being uh, in attendance at a funeral, and also um, Commissioner Shaw is out due to medical reasons. So um, we're going to go ahead and open uh, up for public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on this agenda for, for discussion and possible action. If you wish to be heard, come to the speaker's podium, clearly state your name, address, and spell your last name for the record. The amount any single speaker is allowed will be limited to three minutes. Is there anyone wishing to offer public comment under this public comment period? Is it related to what we're going to be voting on, sir? Or is it related to, okay, we'll wait for the second public comment period at the end. Thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and close that public comment period and we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next agenda item, approval of meeting minutes. And I will now at this time uh, turn it over to the board to entertain a motion to adopt and approve the regular meeting minutes on March 17th, 2022, unless there's any edits or changes any board member seeks to if recommend. There, if there are no further corrections, I move for approval. Second. Okay, I have a first by Commissioner McCurdy and a second by Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, the motion carries. And um, Commissioner Turner, since you're on the phone, if you are not in agreement, just say nay so we know if you're against an item. We just want to make sure we get the, the record clear. All right, uh, agenda item four, approval of the agenda with the inclusion of any emergency items and deletion of any items. Madam Chair, I have a correction. Okay. Um, the correction to item number seven says presenters Michael Maxwell and Tamika Henry, um, they will be moved to agenda number nine, which is a part of my report. Okay, noted. So the presenters that are listed under agenda item seven should go under agenda item nine. The executive director, that's okay. correct. Thank you. Any other um, modifications to the agenda or changes? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. If there are no further corrections, I'll uh, move that we approve the agenda with moving the presenters under item seven to item nine. All right. I have a first by Commissioner McCurdy with the amendment to the agenda, followed by a second from Commissioner Disman. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the acknowledgement of our departed under section three. Oh, no, consent agenda. Sorry, sorry. Section two, before we go to section three. Go ahead and um, move on consent agenda item number five. I move for approval. Okay. Second. I have a first by Commissioner McCurdy and a second by Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, that's the end of the consent, consent agenda items. We're now going to go to section three, which is the commissioner's executive director's recognition. And we always uh, acknowledge our departed. So what list do you have to share with us? Should there be the approval of the write-offs under this or no? 
that, w that was a part of the consent. That Thank was a you. consent. Very good. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we're clear. So um, we wanted to give thoughts and prayers to the families of the following individuals who've um, passed since our last meeting. Um, Sherard Rayford, Kenneth Malone, Dudley Picot, Peter Green, Carolyn Guadio, Clarence Dooling, Johnny Jones, Kay Rubel, Flora Dudley, Charles Brackenberg Jr., Maria Fetchett, uh, B. Wayne Jones, Harold Mann, Lyle Scott, and Craig Thatcher. And I also wanted us to continue to keep Commissioner Craig lifted up. Um, since the tragic incident with her, her brother, she's been in Detroit since then. And I spoke with her via uh, email, and she's hoping to come back to, um, to the city sometimes before the end of the month. But as we could imagine, she's going through a terrible time, and so I told her we would keep her lifted. That concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, and we'll go ahead and hold a moment of silence for all those who have departed. May they rest in peace and uh, may comfort come to their loved ones soon. So we're going to go ahead and move on to section four. Um, these are items taken separately from the consent agenda items. And these are for discussion and possible action. We have agenda item number seven, approval of request to grant family self-sufficiency staff the authority to conduct housing counseling activities in accordance with federal regulations. And uh, Mr. Jordan, who's taking the lead on presenting this one? Okay, Ms. Floyd. Martha Floyd, resident program coordinator. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is just a house cleaning item. We recently went through, we've been a HUD approved housing counseling agency under SNARA since July of 2010. Our FSS coordinators over the last two years have become certified housing counselors. We are conducting housing counseling business as a regular part of what we do. We recently went under um, through a HUD performance review for that program. This is my third one and my fifth that I know of. And it's the first time this item has ever come up for us. But apparently in our bylaws, there is nothing granting agency staff the authority to conduct these activities. So we are just trying to take care of that oversight or whatever you want to call it. Um, but in my conversations with HUD, if you guys approve this action, that comes off as a finding on our audit. Okay, thank you. I'll open it up to any questions from the board members for Ms. Floyd. So Ms. Floyd, if I'm understanding you, this is just something we need to conduct to check the box, but that we've really been doing the work, but we just haven't yes, ma'am, satisfied the standard. This, like I said, this is the first out of five reviews that I know of. This is the first time this has ever been an issue. And it, part of it is we had a new reviewer this year. And, you know, whenever you get somebody, but it, it is simply a matter of, yes, you guys just need to say, staff has the authority to do what we're doing and i wanted to add for the record that there was a list of items that uh, we feel we have satisfactorily satisfactorily addressed that um that came out of this review and to martha's point not necessarily saying things that we weren't doing properly just have you checked this and are you doing that and this is a part of that compliance process Commissioner Turner. Commissioner Turner, do you have a question? Uh, um, comment, question. Um, you are HUD certified counselor, correct? Got the certified. Yeah, currently right now we have, I have one of my newer coordinators that still needs to pass the test, but other than that, eight, um, nine out of the 10 staff are certified, including myself. How about how many counselors do you have? 
I have um, a total of nine FSS coordinators. Do you think that those nine counselors sufficiently <clears throat> um, satisfy the needs of the participants, or do you think we would need more? Currently under our um, approved work plan with HUD, um, we only service our FSS clients under the home ownership program, and that is because of staffing and funding. In order to expand and serve outside of the FSS program, we would need another position because my, the FSS coordinators <clears throat> can Do you believe that you could service and benefit the residents or the participants better if you had more counselors or more... Uh, education or more staff to help the program run more efficiently it runs well with the folks that we are allowed to serve under our grant if if i can mm -hmm. jump in go ahead mr Durden. commissioner to that laundry list of more i like to add more money <laughs> that we don't have and so this is a program that's funded hud says we want you to do this work they give you X amount of dollars to get it done. Uh, we're always looking to get additional dollars. And so from our own coffers, we're not in a position with all of the other priorities we have to add to this. So given, given what we get from, from HUD and the tenacity and capacity of the staff, we are handling our process. So I think Martha would be um, safe to say we're not overburdened Obviously, we want as many people that we serve to be a part of this process. But given what we have to work with, we're, we're, we're meeting those requirements. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> I mentioned that because I wanted to make sure if there is any opportunity to accumulate more resources or funds that we are sufficiently um, meeting the needs of the staff and the residents. Absolutely. Because they can't do their job without money. And they can't, you know, the residents can't benefit if we don't have the services they need. So it puts a burden on the, on the staff, you know, to be able to perform at a high expectation, our maximum <clears throat> potential if we don't have more funds. So I would just like to visit that way of where we can generate more resources or funds so that way we have an outstanding FSS program because as it stands now, I, I believe that it's one of the best, um, I'm going to say, in the country because of the, the productivity of the staff. So hats off to the staff, but <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure if the board is going to be in the oversight of that program as well, that we uh, make sure that the staff can do their job. Well said. Okay, thank you, Commissioner uh, Turner, and I think uh, Commissioner McCurdy also has a comment. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and I, you know, I appreciate the comments of our commissioner. But it just sounds like to me is that you know after the review is done, uh, we've identified ways in which we could improve our uh, performance, but also uh, with the recognition that we are not overburdened but under resourced uh, for the programs in which we are you know charged with providing. So I would just say, as a board, uh, we utilize our collective influence and oversight to make sure that we are communicating with those. Who can help us uh, you know receive additional resources uh, to help Martha get the program executed the way it should be that's my comment thank, thank you, you madam chair and thank you commissioner McCurdy and to commissioner McCurdy's point I think it's incumbent upon all of us as commissioners to look for continued ways to bring more resources to the agency and how we can cooperate and coordinate <coughs> efforts I feel there's so many other siloed efforts happening but if we could all come together and bring the different resources that are supposed to serve the sometimes very same populations, I think we could be moving the needle a lot faster and for the benefit of community. So look forward to head spearing more efforts and bringing more collaboration our way, hopefully with uh, the leadership of our new executive director um, and the appetite to want to do what we can and bring people on board that can offer resources for folks. And I, I just want to say that even families that we can't serve because of the grant restrictions under FSS, we have partnerships with other HUD certified counseling agencies that we refer those clients out to. 
So if we can't provide the service directly, we have partnerships that fill the gap for us. So if there are no further questions or comments, I move for approval of agenda item seven. Okay, I have a first uh, motion uh, to approve agenda item seven by Commissioner McCurdy. I'll second that one. Second by Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please state, uh, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. We're gonna move on to agenda item eight. Approval to award firm fixed price contract for housing agency assessment and analysis to Bronner Group, LLC. And I see we have Mr. Shaw. Yeah, Mr. Shaw is gonna present this one. Good morning, commissioners. Good afternoon, good to see Good you, afternoon, Mr. Shaw. I'm sorry. Uh, Johnny Shaw, procurement manager. Award to, um, approval to award the fixed firm contract to um, uh, Bronner Group LLC for the agency assessment and analysis um, at the request of the executive director during the month of March 2022 RFP P22028 uh, for housing agency assessment and analysis was publicly advertised through the uh, NGM online bidding platform the RFP solicitation closed on April 7 2022 solicitation was advertised to approximately 6,732 firms nationwide a total of 34 firms viewed and downloaded the solicitation only one firm uh, responded to the solicitation and that firm is the Bronner group although Snarr received only one proposal for the solicitation um, for the housing agency and assessment uh, based on chapter 7 of the HUD procurement handbook 7460.8 uh, revision 2 where adequate competition is not achieved and price analysis is performed and the price is reasonable and fair and we also did an extensive outreach through the NGM platform uh, we have the justification to move forward uh, with the contract uh, with your approval uh, for award staff has reviewed the required documents submitted by Bron Bronner Group LLC and performed all background checks uh, that include license ownership debarment from HUD and the SAM uh, platform and found uh, the Bronner Group to be in full compliance with all related requirements for the RFP solicitation P22028 for the housing agency assessment and analysis. Action requested uh, that the executive director is requesting the board of commissioners to review and approve uh, contract C22028 to, to Bronner Group LLC for the housing agency assessment and analysis for not to exceed amount of 150,170. If you have any questions for the Bronner Group, uh, Mr. Plummer is on the line to answer those questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Shaw. Um, and it could be you or the Bronner Group that can maybe speak to what is the scope of services that they will be providing through this housing agency assessment and analysis. Mr. Plummer. Mr. Plummer, can you hear us? Uh, he's not un unmuted. I think you need to unmute your phone. Can you hear me? Now yeah. we can. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. The Bronner Group scope of service will include doing a transition assessment along with a management advisory um, provided to um, the SNRHA. It will be very broad in our scope. And if I could just speak further. I was going to say, we need an interpretation yeah. for that. Because some of us uh, are yes. not natives for, in, for, in for those housing who, speak. Yeah, for those of us who don't speak public housing, we, we're, we're seeking support to have, uh, in this case, the Bronner Group come in and do a full analysis, department by department, look at organizational structure, look at the probability of strategic planning. Um, I, I'm 100 plus days into the work. Uh, we've made some significant changes, but we've also continued to do some good things. Um, they'll come in and help with a fresh set of eyes, looking at how we manage our, how we manage our processes, uh, come in and, and look to share with us best practices, things of that nature. Um, as uh, Mr. Plummer mentioned, this is a transitional assessment to help me in particular understand the, the process the processes that need to be put forth in order to keep the organization running strongly. 
That makes sense because now we know that the scope of services is focused more, more towards our organizational makeup versus yes. our portfolio. So that yeah. wasn't necessarily clear to me. And, and, and I, I want to add to that, when we talk about our portfolio, it does include what we're doing with Section 8. It does include, we have a portfolio called affordable housing that doesn't receive any HUD subsidies at all. We have over 300 scattered site units around the, around the region. Having someone come in and give a either a nod to, yes, the way you're managing these processes are the most efficient, or the way you're managing these processes, we could look at differently. And then to your point, Madam Chair, organizationally, you know, helping you know me and staff understand how we're set up and structured, which tends to be in a very traditional public housing manner. We're a different group as we move forward, and that's what they're coming in to assist in doing. Okay. This Commissioner Turner? Yes, Commissioner Turner. Yeah, um, Director, if you could just speak to also, if you could um, give me a better idea of would this also help us in the neighborhood choice? Because I know that there's a component where um, the strategic planning for um, maybe Marble Manor or beyond, would this help us in fulfilling that need or objective? So, yes, absolutely. The recommendations, suggestions that will come out of this review will help inform us on all of our processes. As you know, the, the CNI is something that's going to be parallel over the next few years. But even today, as we look at how we're managing our properties, how we're interacting with one another, we're looking to see if there's, again, we could be at the best possible way or there could be opportunities to uh, look at things differently. So that assessment, that fresh eyes, and it also informs me on, on, um, on, on my organizational leadership structure. You know, case in point, you know, we have positions like a, uh, a, a communication slash lobbyist that we don't have in place. Um, give me opportunity to look at how I manage the process of deputy director and things of that nature. So all of that will be included, Commissioner. So just one final comment, Madam Chair, if I will. Uh, so just to make sure, so there's going to be an assessment um, and, and I guess a deep dive of what we are to do. And there will be a report received yes. to also include evaluating some of the prior reports that we have already authorized mm -hmm. as a board, I'm assuming. And we will have essentially a timeline uh, uh, of what we can do moving forward to start to execute some of these things that have already been done. Is that correct? Including a portion where you will be interviewed to get perspective on what we're doing and how you say yes. Yeah. So this is this is a um, assessment with a recommendation of implementation. Okay. And right. that's where the responsibility comes back to me candidly Got and it. saying we're spending money to do this. What are we going to do as a result of it? Yes. Thank you. And I also have a question uh, for the Bonner Group representative by uh, Commissioner Black. Yes, uh, Scott Black. Uh, I have a question relative to uh, if, if you've worked with or what other agencies have you worked with in uh, recent times that are um, the size and, and scale of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, just as a, as a point of reference, if you could speak to that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we've worked with a number of uh, public housing authorities throughout the country. Uh, we've worked with New York City, um, the Brownsville, Texas. We've worked with the Chicago Housing Authority, Minneapolis um, uh, Public Housing Authority, um, Columbia Housing Authority. So uh, a, a myriad. We have over um, 30 successful uh, engagements with public housing authorities throughout the country um, in the company's existence. Thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, I'll entertain a motion at this time. If there are no further questions or comments, I will move for approval of agenda item eight. Um, so I have a first to approve agenda item eight by Commissioner McCurdy, a second by Commissioner Disman. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That's the end of our items op uh, open for discussion and possible action. 
I'll go ahead and uh, go to section five, our business items on our agenda. And this is agenda item nine, receive report from the executive director on administrative and operational activities of the agencies. And I know that we did amend our agenda to have the presenters. Yes. So you can tell me, Mr. Jordan, in what uh, succession or who we're gonna invite next. We'll, to we'll save to the us. presenters for last. Okay. Uh, Tracy Torrance from this um, supportive services team will introduce the presenters at the end of my report. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we had quite a bit of activity going on since the last time we came together. Um, we held our CNI kickoff meeting, which included a tour of Marble Manor and the West Side. Additional information is forthcoming on the community engagement strategy. So I want to be very clear. We got together internally to start to develop strategy. The next piece of the process is a, um, a resident survey of Marble Manor, and then we branch out into the broader community. It's my understanding that um, in past processes, we, uh, we really, really needed to make sure that we were inclusive in the general community. So I, I want you to know that that's coming and that this initial meeting was just for us to get together and, and, and put the processes in, in place. We're working with EJP Consulting, who's had a number uh, of successes in helping housing authorities receive CNI implementation grants. Um, again, I just want to remind all of us that we're in a two-year planning stage that could result in the agency receiving up to $50 million for implementation of our plans. This is a collaboration between the City of Las Vegas and the Housing Authority with a very, very strong emphasis on residents and community participation. Um, we testify before the Interim Finance Committee on the need for more affordable housing here in the region. Additionally, staff and I attended the governor's press conference where he officially announced Home Means Nevada uh, affordable housing plan. This is where $500 million will go towards creating and preserving affordable housing here in our great state. The application process for these grants is open through May 15th. There are multiple categories that we can apply for, such as rehab, new construction, acquisition, and staff in our meeting uh, as early as next week to really start asking ourselves what, what we should apply for and what better positions us to be awarded some of those dollars. Shortly after the governor's press conference, we had the pleasure of touring some of our properties with United States Deputy Secretary of HUD, Adrian Totman. And please note that I gave uh, Ms. Totman your regrets, as I know that uh, board members would have liked, particularly the chair and, and uh, vice chair would have liked to have been there. And uh, letting her know that you were actually in D.C. while we she was. We were in opposite towns. Exactly. Like she was visiting Vegas. We were in D.C. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but we, um, I wanted to just state while we tout, always touting the need for more money, more vouchers uh, in our regions, um, staff and I proudly showed the set Deputy Secretary how we successfully use HUD tools like RAD to redevelop. Um, we visited the property Wardell as well as Rose Garden. And um, I, I, I would say that all indications suggested that she enjoyed the visit, um, had an opportunity to see units, walk halls, you know, things of that nature to get a, a really, really good understanding of what we've done. Uh, I wanna thank Commissioner Black for inviting me to his table, to be his table guest at the State of North Las Vegas uh, Mayor's Address. In addition to being very informative, I was able to connect with potential partners that could support our efforts to preserve and expand affordable housing here in the region. So time, time well spent. I also want to uh, recognize both Commissioner Davis in her absence and Commissioner Desmond for recently attending and completing training intended, intended to help them better understand their very impo important role as commissioners. Uh, also, we have additional uh, commissioners that will be attending other training next month. And I, I just want to say it's fulfilling for me as an executive director to have a board that's in a stage of continuous learning because continuous learning leads to continuous improvement. And so I wanted to recognize that. And I, uh, if I may use 
prerogative to. Absolutely. Come up here and present it so we can take a, right. a capture this moment on film. And maybe we stand as board members next to Commissioner Desmond as well. Yes. Thank you for acknowledging that investment of time of our commissioners and being better prepared and skilled and helping lead our agency as commissioners. So that's very, very important. And it's much appreciated, Madam Chair. Um, next item, I wanted to get more into the operational side of what's going on. As a, as a means of improving customer service, we made some modifications to the agency's call center. Effective tomorrow, 422, Residents will now have the ability to call in routine work orders five days a week. As you recall, the office closed this on Friday, but just as a means of providing better service, um, we're working with internal staff and a vendor who will keep the phones on on Friday. Note that um, emergency calls have also always been answered 24 seven, but we're going to start a process that will allow those routine calls to come in five days a week. And additionally, we will soon, and we're working through contractual issues right now, but we'll have a five-day phone service availability for everyone, our voucher holders, the general public. And again, that's just our way of providing a better sense of customer service. The uh, RFP for project-based vouchers, as we indicated, we still have planned to go to hit the street in May. We have to submit it to HUD for approval. Uh, we are clearly of the mind that it'll meet all of the criteria that HUD is, um, has for project-based vouchers. And we're also, we'll be planning while this um, item is out on the street, we're going to do a, a um, developers conference. And I envision it be at part virtual, part in person. But th this is a, a big moment for our agency. And we want the developer community to know that we want to partner. We want to partner to, to build. Um, we want to partner to use vouchers. We want to partner to swap land. You know, I, we, we've had these conversations about building housing and being cognizant of making sure that we're, we're building and partnering in those areas where there's opportunity. And so that'll be a part of the process as we move forward. Um, in addition to the notion of supporting better customer service, uh, the ACV department has um, developed a landlord advisory board. We have a group of landlords that we're meeting with um, right now every other month to just talk about issues in which we can get better at as a service provider. One of the recommendations that came out of such meetings that we've implemented already 
if you're a landlord that deals with our housing authority, we've set up a dedicated phone line for you to call. You don't have to call in and go through the process that uh, most voucher holders, there's a specific line going directly to the acting director and deputy director that will have us address those issues. So we really feel good about that. Additionally, we're applying for 50 mainstream vouchers, 50 more mainstream vouchers. And these are um, a part of the HUD boutique voucher program that focuses on non-elderly disabled individuals that will be able to apply for a Section 8 voucher and hopefully we'll be able to find housing for them, again, as a part of this overall strategy to improve our relationships with landlords. Um, we're continue to build, continuing to build our momentum in administering the emergency housing vouchers. And if you all recall, those are the vouchers that are more specific to addressing the homeless situation. Our partnership with the Continuum of Care, which is at the county, and, the, um, and utilizing a number of waivers HUD has provided has allowed us to streamline our administrative process, which is resulting in housing people at a much faster rate. Uh, we currently have, we've housed 200, a little more than 200 families of the 568 special vouchers we received. Working with the county and other community partners, including the landlords, we're very optimistic that we will be able to cont have continued success. Countrywide, only about 19% of these vouchers have been, um, have resulted in people being housed. I'm pleased to say that we're at 32% and um, no, that's not good enough. We still have to push harder, but I just wanted to, to state that staff is working hard with creativity, the utilization of the, the waivers. As a matter of fact, on Tuesday, um, staff and, and I participated in a national webinar that was hosted by HUD, had about 180 individuals on the, on the webinar from housing authorities all over the country. And we were held up as an example of partnerships and collaboration. And, and I, I say we, not just the housing authority, but the strong partnership we have with the county and the CLC. So that's um, some of the things on the, on the housing choice voucher side. Uh, we're continuing to improve communications with residents at James Down Towers as we had our monthly RAD meeting. And this, in the last monthly meeting, we brought the architect in who actually talked about some of the design work and, and the thought processes that came behind the design work. And, and I'll tell you, commissioners, there was a stark difference than the first meeting I attended, where in this case, residents were really speaking to a high level of appreciation for the things that staff thought about, you know, things like, you know, grab bars, you know, by the toilet and by the, by the bathtub. In fact, someone mentioned that you're designing this like you would live here. And that's exactly what our intent is to make sure that people feel that, um, that, that, that sense of, of, of ownership and pride, but more importantly, know that we feel the same way. So those meetings are continually continuing to go well. Um, we're making progress on our lobby, lobby um, improvement, both at the Section 8 office across the parking lot, as well as in Flamingo. And I'm gonna just go out on a, a limb and say that our next meeting Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to just walk across the parking lot and show you the differences. And I'm pretty certain we'll be there because most of the work is done. We're looking at putting in new acoustic tiles. Some of the concerns we had from uh, just obvious, if you go in and, and you speak on the microphone, the entire office or lobby area gets to hear whatever's being said. So we're looking to address things like that. We paint it. We're bringing in new furniture. So really working hard to f make it feel like a good experience for those who come in. Um, I wanted to also recognize Tracy Torrance. You know, Commissioner McCurdy, you, you said something earlier about our ability to find additional resources. Um, Tracy recently sought out to find some additional resources for computers in our senior buildings. 
and she was successful in receiving $13,000, a $13,000 grant to add additional computers in our senior buildings. And that's, that's above and beyond, you know, the, the notion of using um, relationships and resources, you know, as the chair said, to knock down some of those silos. And uh, that's just one example of uh, what we're doing and we're doing well. Um, before I bring up Tracy to introduce our community partners, I'd like to entertain questions. Do we have any questions so far? I don't hear any. We can move on. Very good. Okay. I'd like to bring up Tracy Torrance from our supportive services team who will introduce our guests. And as you all remember or recall, uh, every month I like to bring partners into the board meeting to help us better understand how we collectively as a community serve our, our uh, families. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, Tracy Torrance, Supportive Services Manager. Uh, unfortunately, one of our presenters, Ms. Tamika Henry from uh, the Aboto Collective, was unable to make it. She sent an email at the last minute. There was another event she attended and uh, got held over. However, I would like to present Dr. Michael Maxwell. Um, he is the Executive Director for Ocelero Learning and one of our longtime partners. So, Dr. Maxwell. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and everyone in attendance. I'm happy to be here this morning. I was asked to give a presentation uh, about Ocelero Learning Clark County. Um, and so I'm going to take a few minutes and give an orientation uh, to Ocelero Head Start in Clark County. Um, if we can go. And we're starting with uh, the picture on the opening slide is the Strong Start Academy at Wardell which was a partnership between the city of Las Vegas, uh, the Housing Authority, and Oslero Learning. Um, next slide, please. All right, and with Oslero, we have a brand new vision and mission. Um, they are very thoughtful and considerate, and also you can see they're, they're not the easiest to memorize. So I will sum it up in saying that we are about the business of uh, opening our children and our families' eyes to the possibilities for the future and putting them on the pathway to early learning so that they can achieve their dreams in the future. And so I really look at the last part of that vision statement that says that we don't want anything in the way of, of them achieving their infinite promise. That's both for our children and for our families. We follow a two-generation approach, typically is a multi-generation approach because we have a lot of grandparents that are part of our, pro our, excuse me, of our program. Okay. Our core values, um, data-informed learning, we are constantly collecting data on our children, on our families, the entire program, and it's a constant cycle of collecting data, of making assessments, and then deciding on what are some things that we need to adjust to better our program. So a constant cycle of um, changing and, improve, and improvement. Um, transparent and open communication. Uh, we have a growth mindset. We're always looking at what can we do better. So that growth mindset, um, always looking at innovation. And then lastly, caring teams and community, um, of which the Housing Authority has been a part of our partnership in the community uh, for many years. In fact, we have, I mentioned, I showed the opening picture of Strong Start Wardell, but in one of our locations is also a partnership with the Housing Authority at Herbert, Herb Kaufman out there off of Flamingo and Nellis. Okay, and we've been, Ocelero, the network, the national network, has been transforming early learning since 2001, uh, producing breakthrough child outcomes. So we have been recognized across the nation uh, for early, early Head Start and Head Start uh, and the achievements that we've been able to, uh, the outcomes we've been able to produce. We now serve over 5,000 children in four states. Um, and then our SHINE Early Learning Division um, is in 22 states. Our SHINE Early Di Learning Division basically takes what they've learned from what we do in the four delegates in the four states. We take that information and we share that with child care providers across the nation. 
Uh, so that's what our Shine Early Learning Division does. They provide technical assistance to child care providers so that they can be on that process of innovation and improvement just like we do in-house with our four, four delegates. Okay. Um, also we, here in Clark County, we began providing Head Start services uh, in Las Vegas in 2008. Um, and then the, we're the only Head Start provider in the service area. Um, we do have early Head Start, which we started in 2017. There is another early Head Start provider, and that is Sunrise Children's Foundation. Um, we are not in competition at all. We just look at ourselves as being able to work with Sunrise Children's Foundation. Our intent is to make sure that all kids have the, the best high quality early childhood education in the Valley. And we will work with anybody to make sure we achieve those, those gains. And Dr. Maxwell, can you educate those of us uh, here? What does, what's the difference between Head Start and Early Head Start? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Head Start is for three to five year olds and Early Head Start is, starts even earlier, six weeks to three years old. So we have babies. We, take, we, we have babies and we introduce the children, the babies and parents and families to education, early, early Head Start, excuse me, early childhood education as early as six weeks old. Okay. Uh, did, I, did that answer or do you have any other questions? And I did not know that was coming right up. So <laughs> I'm right. glad you had included it. <laughs> um, our, within our program, we have a number of different program types. So we have half day, which typically is about three hours. Um, so if you think of half day as part time, uh, we have full day, uh, which can run from eight o'clock to two o'clock in the afternoon. And then we have extended day. So we have parents who are working and they need to have childcare uh, available. We have felt folks who have their children in our program from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. Okay. Uh, and then we also have the Nevada Department of Education, Nevada Ready Pre-K. That is a special grant that they've made available that raises the quality of, uh, of education for early, early childhood even higher. And so one of the requirements that they have is that the teachers must have a bachelor's degree uh, to teach in those classrooms. So they provide additional funding so that we can pay those teachers more and provide even better uh, materials in those classrooms. So we have a number of partnerships that go into supporting and program types that support what we do. We have 15 locations throughout the Las Vegas Valley, 13 centers. We have a main kitchen, which is out off of Post Road uh, in Henderson. Uh, and then we also have our office or our main headquarters, which is off of um, Cheyenne and uh, Decatur. Okay, so 15 locations. And then the municipalities, we work with, we have uh, partnerships in the city of Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, uh, Henderson, and with Clark County. And then our funded enrollment right now is th uh, 1,384. And then we have 300 plus employees. I included this uh, map here so that you could see we have on this map, I have a pen for every child where they live in Las Vegas. You can see the reach that Ocelero Head Start has. We have kids from all over the count. Well, I'll say this, the valley. We have kids from all over the valley. And if you look to the bottom right, we even have kids from Boulder City who actually come in to attend our Head Start, excuse me, our Henderson location. What, what percentage of children who live in public housing do you serve? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can get that information. But we do have families from Wardell who clearly take advantage of this. I believe we have families, you have families from Wardell and you have families, and I forgot the name of the uh, development Is right off. Vera A or, I, I know it's a little bit further down, right. I know you're talking about, yeah. Okay. And I'm sure we have some others from the Housing Authority residents who are participants in some of our other programs. But I will pull that information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. And the children that, that are in our program receive high quality education, educational services, as I mentioned, health screenings. Typically, when you think of health screenings, you, you think of the school district and what they do. They have vision and they have hearing. We have vision, we have hearing, we have lead, we have growth assessments. We have a plethora of assessments and screenings that we do so that we can put, make sure that our kids' health is the best at the early ages so that if there's anything that may come up as an issue, we can address it at a time when kids are formidable um, 
to be able to make those changes and make sure that the parents are aware of some of those things that need to be done so that they can become successful when they enter the K-12 system. Very good. Dr. Maxwell. Yes, sir. Uh, I know that there was a, a needs assessment done uh, by you to see where most of the children and referrals were coming from. Uh, where, what municipality or what location did you see the most need uh, you know, with that assessment? The highest need that we saw was in North Las Vegas. We have the closest uh, location that we have is uh, the Cecile Walnut building, which is off of Walnut and Cheyenne. We don't have any locations further north. In fact, if I go back to that map, if you look at, uh, let's see, it says, you can see where it says Sun City or Summerlin, Sun City, Summerlin. You can see where it's, there's a piece of North uh, Nellis Air Force Base. If you draw a line horizontally across from Nellis Air Force Base, look at all the pins that are up there. And that's actually, that, that still is kind of cutting off North Las Vegas. We need to drop down about where it says Sun City, Summerlin and draw a line horizontally across. All of those pens are kids that are coming from North Las Vegas, but they go to our centers that are much further deeper or deeper into the city or in throughout the valley. But we don't have any centers in North Las Vegas. There's a great need out there. And those are just the folks who have come to Ocelero and sought us out. Right. Um, and thank you for that enlightenment. What we're trying to see is, you know, uh, we have three different municipalities and localities, you know, represented here. So it's really helpful for us to see, you know, what we need, what opportunities exist, uh, but furthermore, how we can, you know, better uh, deepen our relationship. Yes. And to that point, since we're back on the map, the color coding, can you kind of speak to what the different colors of the pinpoints sure. mean? As I mentioned, we have 13 locations. There are 13 different variations of colors here and each color would be uh, um, belong to One a particular center. So if you look down at the bottom right, most of them are brown. They are at the Herb, Herb Kaufman site out off of Flamingo and So Nellis. Wardell, what color is Wardell? Wardell most likely is going to be the yellow. So we have, we have kids from Wardell that come all throughout uh, the yellow and mostly, it's probably actually the red, excuse me. If you look, and again, the variations of colors, but that red, that is that um, there are quite a few on the eastern side of town. Mm -hmm. That is, it's, I believe it's either the brown or the, well, the lighter brown or the red there on the map. And if you have these numbers on you, what is the current wait list uh, of children coming from North Las Vegas or East Las Vegas or historic West Las Vegas? Um, we do have a wait list, and I couldn't give you the exact number right now, um, but because of COVID, we do have some openings, um, but typically when we have, like right now, we have kids on, on a wait list because the parents are looking for a specific program type, like they need extended day, but our extended days might be full. So that's why we have, we have a wait list, but we do have some openings, but if we could get uh, locations that that could house extended day then we could we could open that up and probably move the folks off of our wait list and as you seek to grow do you have the workforce needed to facilitate expansion child care providers across the nation are facing uh, challenges as far as hiring but I will tell you that ours we right now we have 36 requisitions that are open 36 which as people are getting back into the workforce, we are filling those positions. And I do believe that if we were to expand or grow, we can fill the, we can fulfill those, those staffing positions. Yep. And we're in the process of partnering with uh, programs such as uh, Workforce uh, Connections and other organizations that are kind of filling the pipeline with prospective educators. So yes, we, we could have That's that. precisely where I was going. Thank, Thank you. you. Any more questions on that um, regarding the map or? Okay. I know I was given five minutes, so I'm probably past my time. Um, well, since so, Ms. Henry didn't make it, you can you. take some of that time. <laughs> <laughs> and so here I just included um, our pyramid of what we try to look for as far as establishing uh, a basis for what we do for families uh, in our programs. And so we wanna make sure first and foremost, we're engaging families and children in children's learning and development, family well-being, 
uh, families of children with chronic health problems, as I mentioned earlier, are those screenings will give us that information and we can, ad we can address uh, the needs of those, those families. And then vulnerable, the most vulnerable families, we have partnerships like the housing authority. Uh, we have many partnerships where those vulnerable families, we can get them the help that they need. Okay. Um, the picture that I included here is during the height of COVID, when we went virtual, the families that relied on us for food and so forth, we still provided that food. We delivered the food. This is one of our service, our, uh, food service workers actually dropping off food at one of our family's homes. And you can see the food is on the, uh, uh, there's some bags on the uh, little stoop right there. And then the person that, that, that the resident is kind of waving. So we would drop the food off. We, there's no contact, drop the food off, say hi, thank you and we would go on our way. And we were doing that so that our kids would have breakfast, lunch, and a snack every day, just like they would if they were in our centers. Okay. And then our family services, um, community resources such as GED, college assistance, uh, English as a second language, workforce development. We are, as I mentioned, we have a number of partners, community partners, and we're constantly building that partnership, those partnerships. Um, family medical and dental referrals. We have, again, partnerships. If there's a need and families say they can't afford or they don't have, guess what? We're gonna make sure that they do have. Um, nutrition education and hands-on workshops. We do that constantly. Uh, we have a lot of our staff that focus on these areas. And so they are able to kind of specialize and tailor the needs uh, uh, of training and so forth that we do to, to what the families need. And then finally, and I shouldn't say finally, but the last bullet point here is very important. We are an entry to the workforce for many folks. 25% of our current staff were parents with children in our program. They were not working. And then when they, when, when they joined our, our policy council or our parent council, so we teach parents about uh, how to be a part of the decision making, they're part of our governance. And so, and then we also encourage families if they're not working, hey, you know, we have an opening, consider, you know, applying for this job. And it may be entry level, but once we get them in there, in fact, our director of education started out as um, a teacher assistant in our program. And she has promoted all the way to becoming uh, part of our senior leadership team. Okay. And finally, here's uh, my information for contact. Um, always willing to reach out and continue to extend our partnerships. And as you said, uh, Commissioner McCurdy, we are definitely looking to create some, some more uh, opportunities uh, within the Valley, uh, especially in North Las Vegas, but you have overlapping uh, jurisdictions there and we would be more than happy to uh, venture into that, okay? so. Any questions that I can answer from commissioners? Any ED? questions, commissioners? I, I do have a question, but I can hold mine until I hear yours. I just was wondering, since you serve the four municipalities, City of Vegas, North Las Vegas, Count, Clark County, and Henderson, what are, what are the few, what are the first points of contact that most of the families encounter that are putting Acelero on the map for families? Because obviously a lot of our parents are new to our area. They're coming from out of state. Um, also, you know, there's those of us that just know about the public school systems. So how do they know about your early Head Start and your Head Start programs? And how do they know then to go seek you versus what they traditionally have known? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, word of mouth. Parents who are in our programs, they typically live in communities where, you know, there are families that have the same needs. So for, first and foremost, word of mouth. But then we have radio ads that run, that are running year round. We used to run ads that would be around the recruitment time, enrollment time at the beginning of the year. But with COVID, we said, and once, once I came to, uh, Ocelero and joined Ocelero two years ago. I said, look, we need, everybody should know about Ocelero. So following your question, radio ads that are constant, 
Um, and then we're also forming, again, those relationships, those partnerships with other organizations that spread the word for us. Um, and then we have events like we have our upcoming FAM Jam, which is at the uh, uh, East Las Vegas Library. Um, and that FAM Jam is open to the public. Um, and that's where we're getting information out. So we do lots of outreach, uh, but radio seems to have the most, um, the most impact. Uh, and then we are looking at, with uh, available funding, we're also looking at doing some uh, billboards also in high traffic areas. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I've seen some of your billboards on buses. Do yes. you work with the RTC as well? Mm -hmm. We have a, a campaign with RTC both inside, inside the bus. and outside. Much like the, the library district has their information about how to access their digital libraries. You yes. guys also have that for us, Alero. Yes. Do we have it in Espanol? We do. Okay. We do. Our, all of our recruiting and enrollment information is, is also on Spanish mobile. radio, Spanish media. It's also on Spanish radio. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. That was it. Any further questions? You know, Commissioner, just as a follow up to your question, uh, specifically, what do we do to let our families that, and our developments know about the process and the services? Well, we attend the, the regular meetings of the Housing Authority. Okay. The PCC. The PCC. PCC. Okay. And I say we, of course, I don't, I don't get to come to all the meetings, but uh, my, my senior leaders who are able to attend, they share the information, uh, and then from there it gets disseminated out. And so we can share that. And that's interesting because this added process to our board meetings was a result of me attending PCC meetings. So very good. And then it funnels down to the site in which we hand out information. Thank you. And it sounds like we Ms. also Floyd, come to the mic so yeah. we can hear you. Why don't you speak to that, Martha? <laughs> um, Astolero has been a partner with FSS for as long as I've been here, and I'm not going to tell you how long that is. Um, <laughs> but we have um, the relationship we have with them. We now have it set up through our case management software that when a family comes in and they need Acelero services, we can send a direct email right to Acelero from our case management services. Thank you for that clarification. I need Martha to, to uh, speak up for us uh, more often. Uh, but yes, we, we have these partnerships and the Families of Self-Sufficiency Program. We even had some of our staff who were residents who participated in the program and graduated. So it's, there is a benefit and definitely a need, so we've seen that, so thank you. Well, I just want to thank you, Dr. Maxwell, because the importance of early education can't be expressed enough. We know that the return on investment and in making sure that our babies have a strong foundation from crib to pre-entry into our school systems is, I think, undervalued and sometimes underestimated. And so as I hear the woes of um, a lot of my former colleagues in the classrooms and how they're struggling with children coming into our kindergarten classrooms uh, post-pandemic and how much time our kids are really spending. This shouldn't be the babysitters of our children because I don't think this is helping. I think the screen time is really hindering our kids' ability to really be successful in a classroom setting. And so the earlier we can get our kids' curiosity and engagement and pre-literacy skills and vocabulary is such a key piece to this. If our kids' vocabulary isn't at a certain level before they enter pre-K or even K settings, I mean, they're already in an uphill battle to make it through um, into high school years. And so I just want to say early educators and pre-K teachers are my heroes because they are the ones setting a strong foundation for what then we build on when they come into our mainstream campuses. So thank you so much for doing this work. I appreciate that. And I, I know that I'm preaching to the choir as far as early childhood. Um, I believe this is a solution for most of the challenges that, challenges that our children face in society. So if we could expand and serve more children, that's, that's my goal. So thank you for the opportunity to, to speak in front of everyone and the commissioners. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you.
Okay, and um, we do have a second public comment period I have not forgotten about. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and open the second public comment. Um, so items raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon by the Board of Commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority until the notice provisions of the open meeting law have been complied with. So if you wish to speak under the second public comment period, please come up to the podium and um, clearly state your name, address, and spell your last name for the record. And the limited amount of time any single speaker will get will be three minutes. So I know this young man has been waiting patiently for the duration of the meeting. Please come up and offer your public comment. And if there's anybody else, please follow him. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Chairman, and our new Executive Director, Mr. Jordan. I haven't been up here in, in quite a while. Uh, my uh, former uh, associate, uh, Ms. Vanessa Hamlin, whom you, I'm sure, all are familiar with, we worked together at uh, James Down Towers for many years. Uh, I, first of all, apologize for my attire. I, I'm a veteran as well and uh, just got through instructing, uh, helping veterans. Uh, to learn the sport of pickleball, which has become very popular. It's available at Doula Gym, and we offer it to veterans at no charge. So if there are any veterans in the group that want to get exercise, please, please come down. My name is Matulis, M-A-T-U-L-I-S. I'm at uh, Sartini Plaza currently. I left um, Jamestown Towers due to mold which took me about a year to recover my brain so that the elevator hopefully is going to the top floor where I can address you all and state my current situation at Sartini Plaza. I've lived there for almost a year now. It took me a while to realize that the dog barking and uh, uh, situation down below was not from the uh, bed bug exterminators who often left their dogs in the vehicle below. It was my resident, fellow resident down below me. I've addressed this issue to our management. They've told me that they've contacted people above them and that there's nothing that is being done. Not only is a dog barking and keeping me awake and so on at night, but it's defecating on the patio and the smell is uh, horrible. Uh, I'm sure that a pit bull is not allowed with, within the HUD rules and regulations and how this has happened. I, uh, I'm uh, flabbergasted, quite frankly. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, bring up was uh, currently we're being, uh, the hallways are being stripped and, and uh, cleaned and, and waxed and, and the people, the contractors are doing a fantastic job. Yet again, what I feel should have been addressed first, and I've uh, spoken about that in the past, is that our ducts need cleaning. So our health issues are much more important than the aesthetic value. And uh, if any of you want to come down and see the dust and dirt that comes through the ducts, especially now that the air conditioning is starting up, it's horrible. Uh, I was told uh, several years ago when I was here that the filters should be changed or, or were being changed every six months or so. I have not seen anything close to that in the year that I've lived at Sartini Plaza. So I will address some of the other issues. Uh, I've already spoken with Mr. Jordan when he arrives at Sartini Plaza, and those are my main issues at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matulis, and I know that uh, the staff have been taking notes as you've been speaking, so I appreciate you bringing those concerns to our attention. Any further public comment? I think you need to say that. Go ahead. You can articulate. You know, I was just, uh, just Vice Chair. speaking to our chair about this, the Seventh Army. They were the first to see battle in World War II. So we just want to thank you for your service, sir. 
Thank you for teaching our veterans pickleball. I know there's so many people hooked on it. I think we need to keep them active and, and enjoying activities, you know? Just because we're older doesn't mean we don't get to have fun. All right, anything else for the good of the order? I include myself in that because I'm getting older every day. <laughs> there you go. That's life. We got to enjoy every day. Okay, seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>